In public, you pass as an unremarkable individual, but you can feel the itchy straw stuffing inside of you. <laughs> Hold on. So number eight, you're, you're a scarecrow. <laughs> you're just a scarecrow. Hello players and GMs, I am Reese, and welcome to another video by Jetpack7. Before we get started, I just want to remind you all to please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. We have some awesome videos coming up in the very near future, not to mention a book being released this year where we will have updates and whatnot. Next week's video is actually going to be a bit of a homebrew writing workshop. Uh, I'm designing one of the new archetypes that will be going into our next book, Blackstorm Realms, and I'm going to walk you all through the process of creating that archetype, what kind of stuff goes into creating an archetype for a new book. So keep an eye out for that. Make sure you have the notification bell on so that you can be one of the first people to see that video. As you can tell, this week we have another Unearthed Arcana review. Wizards of the Coast just released this new Gothic Lineages our Unearthed Arcana, so I guess we've got some new race options, is my guess. This one was written by F. Wesley Schneider, Ben Petrosor, and Jeremy Crawford, obviously a couple familiar names with input from the rest of the D&D design team. There's been a bit of a stir about this one. It has a couple things that have gotten a pretty fair amount of attention from the community. Um, I'm personally very excited about all of the things they're introducing in this one. So uh, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, as you can see here, the three options are the Dampier, uh, which is some vampire stuff, I guess. It's uh, Hexblood and Reborn. No idea what these other two are, but um, Dampier is going to go into some vampire stuff, so <laughs> that's pretty exciting. First of all, they have introduced a creating your character section. Um, I'm not sure what's super different about this one. Uh, at first level, you choose whether your character is a member of the human race or one of the game's fantastical races. Alternatively, you can choose one of the following lineages. If you choose a lineage, you might have once been a member of another race, but you aren't any longer. Okay, so this is basically just saying that you can choose this lineage in place of a character race. It's pretty much just another race, um, but you can have, like, physical features of a half-orc and then also be a Dampier or a Hexblood or a Reborn. Um, but the in terms of, like, racial features that you'll get from this, it is strictly from this lineage and not from uh, one of the game's other races. It uh, looks like ability score increases are simplified. You can raise one score by two and another one by one, and that seems to be it. There doesn't seem to be anything else involved in that. Um, languages, you can speak, read, and write common, and one other language. Um, creature type. Let's see, every creature in D&D, including every player character, has a special tag in the rules that identifies the type of creature they are. Most player characters are humanoid, but the race options presented here tells you what your character's creature type is. Okay, so they're actually, it looks like they're introducing a way for you to be a different creature type than a humanoid, which up until now I don't think has happened. So that's pretty cool. Uh, it looks like there will actually be options for you to be affected by spells and effects that otherwise would only affect one of these other creature types like the elementals and the aberrations and fiends and fey and all that stuff. So it looks like we might be able to get some unique player character interactions than what we used to have. Like right here, the example given is that Cure Wounds doesn't work on a construct or undead. So if you create a construct construct player character, you won't be able to be healed <laughs> by um, a lot of the a lot of the healing spells, which is unique. Um, I did read through this one. It pretty much just clarifies what they said in Tasha's. Um, it seems like they're moving towards making it official and not so much of an optional thing where races won't have specific additions to their ability score modifiers languages or uh, alignment or anything like that all of that is looking to move away seems like they want people to just be able to pick more widely from the race options and not have to be as beholden to one or the other based on what class they want to play which I like personally just for the options because I want to be able to play a half-orc wizard and not get plus two to strength. <laughs> As a wizard, I would like to be able to kind of assign those attributes wherever I want instead of worrying about what the game is telling me. So let's go ahead and look at the Dampier first of all. 
Poised between the worlds of the living and the dead, Dampiers retain their grip on life yet are endlessly tested by vicious hungers. Their ties to the undead, okay, so we're looking, okay, so yeah, the, uh, we are straight up looking at an undead player character creature type. Their ties to the undead grant Dampiers a taste of a vampire's deathless prowess in the form of increased speed, dark vision, and a life-draining bite. With unique insights into the nature of the undead, many Dampiers turn to the lives of adventurers and monster hunters. Their reasons are often deeply personal. Some seek danger, blah blah blah, flavor text, tempt hunger, vampires, things. Every Dampier knows a thirst slaked only by the living. This desire is a whisper in the mind, a tinge to the sight, a reflex constantly needing to be suppressed. Those who overindulge their thirst risk losing control and forever viewing others as prey. Okay, so basically, if you make this character, they're saying that you can be tempted, that you're always going to be tempted by a thirst for blood or whatever else, and it looks like this is actually a bit of a um, rollable table to determine what your damp your character is tempted by. Blood, flesh or raw meat, cerebral spinal fluid, esoteric humors. Okay, psychic energy. A color from one's appearance, dreams, and life energy. Okay. Some pretty unconventional ones in there, for sure. I don't really know what esoteric humors means, um, <laughs> or how that's going to tempt a Dampier character to eat someone, but hey, who am I to judge? Sometimes I just see those esoteric humors and I, I get hungry too. Dampier origins. Okay, so we've got some origins here now. You are the reincarnation of an ancestor who is a vampiric tyrant. Your pact with a predatory deity, fiend, fey, or spirit causes you to share their hunger. You survived being attacked by a vampire, but were forever changed. A parasite inhabits your body. Oh, okay. You loved an immortal and were willing to be transformed into a vampire to join them, but tragedy interrupted the transformation. This is backstory stuff, basically. We're just getting into how your character became a vampire uh, with some pretty... Pretty fun options. Yeah, these all seem pretty standard. Uh, I feel like I've actually played with most of these in a campaign where a uh, character's been through something similar to this. In fact, I think I'm playing in a campaign right now where one of the characters in our party has both number four and number eight. <laughs> uh, not so much making him reliant on vital fluids, but... So the traits of the Dampier, medium or small, actually. And you can be humanoid and undead, so you can be multiple... Um, multiple creature types, which it mentioned higher. You've got 35 feet of movement, which is fun. I like that. Um, dark vision, spider climb. You have a climbing speed equals your walking speed. In addition, at third level, you can move up, down, and across vertical surfaces. That's that's terrifying. <laughs> but I'm I'm glad they're adding spider climb into a base uh, into a playable race. This is a lot. It it seems kind of Kind of strong compared to a lot of the other racial features that you get from some of the base um, races in in 5e so some of this might go away when it's made official but i like the ideas uh, i like the increased movement speed i like the spider climb now let's look at this vampiric bite your fanged bite is a natural weapon which counts as a simple melee weapon with which you are proficient you add your constitution modifier to the attack and damage rolls when you attack with your bite that's fun don't have that yet your bite deals 1d4 piercing damage on a hit. While you are missing half or more of your hit points, you have advantage on attack rolls you make with this bite. That's okay. I like this a lot. When you use your bite and hit a creature that isn't a construct or an undead, you can empower yourself in one of the following ways of your choice. Regain hit points equal to the damage dealt by the bite or gain a bonus to the next ability check or attack roll you make. The bonus equals the damage dealt by the bite. Oh, that's pretty good actually. You can empower yourself with your bite a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Okay, so they are limiting how often you can empower yourself with your bite. I'm glad they're limiting it to the number of times that you can actually empower yourself, but regardless of that, I think this is a really cool mechanic, actually. I'm, I'm glad they're adding unique attacks to these races as well. It seems like they're wanting to uh, make the playable character options a little bit more um, variable. They're adding a bit more variety into the player character options, which is really exciting to me. And it's actually making me want to play one of these races. Uh, whereas in kind of base 5e, it was kind of 
it was more determined by what attributes I got. Uh, before they changed all this stuff, it was just kind of like, what what attributes did I get? What kind of nice features did I get? Every now and then there were some that are really strong and others that are pretty underwhelming. These in particular add enough variety and actual new and unique interactions with mechanics that didn't exist before. So I am actively interested in playing these, which is pretty exciting. All right, so that's the damn pier. Let's look at Hexblood. I have no clue what this one is. Where wishing fails, ancient magic can offer a heart's desire, at least for a time. Hexbloods are individuals infused with eldritch magic, fey energy, or mysterious witchcraft. Some who enter into bargains with hags gain their deepest wishes, but eventually find themselves transformed. These changes evidence a hag's influence. Ears that split in forked points, skin in wild shapes, lengthy hair that regrows if cut, and an irremovable living crown. Okay, so this is... are you a hag? Okay, I'll, I'll read this in a second. While many Hexbloods gain their lineage after making a deal with a hag, others reveal their nature as they age, particularly if a hag influenced them early in their... Okay, so this is... This is moving into like a hag player character. You can become a hag or someone that is uh, kind of spawned or influenced in a physical way by the magic of a hag or something similar. Heir of hags. One way hags create more of their kind is through the creation of hex bloods. Every hex blood exhibits features suggestive of the hag whose magic inspired their powers. This includes an unusual crown often called an elder cross or witch's turn. This living garland-like part of a Hexblood's body extends from their temples and wraps around their head, serving as a visible mark of the bargain between Hag and Hexblood. A debt owed or a change to come. That's disturbing. What's it look like? It's garland-like, but it's living. And it's just there permanently. Okay, so let's read this Becoming a Hag section. Hags can undertake a ritual to irreversibly transform a Hexblood they created into a new Hag, either one of their own kind or that embodies the Hexblood's nature. This requires that both the Hag and Hexblood be in the same place and consent to the lengthy ritual, circumstances most Hexbloods shun but might come to accept over the course of centuries. Once a Hexblood undergoes this irreversible ritual, they emerge as a Hag NPC no longer under the control of the Hexblood's player unless the DM rules otherwise. Weird. This is an odd one to me because you can choose to become a Hag, but then unless the DM rules otherwise, you lose control of your player character, which is odd. I don't, I don't really know. I, I guess this is a, a unique way to say that I don't really feel like playing this character anymore and I want to roll a new one. If I'm going to play a Hexblood who wants to become a hag, then I want to play as a hag, you know? I guess the little unless the DM rules otherwise bit is kind of the key, the key part right there, but it's weird to me that this is the base rule that they emerge as a hag NPC. I feel like the base rule should be you emerge as a hag and then the DM can decide if they don't have control of their PC. But the base rule, I think, should be the PC maintaining control, right? Especially if it was a consensual ritual that they went through. Um, here's more of the origins. Uh, again, most of these are flavor. Seeking a child, your parents made a bargain with a hag, you're the result of that arrangement, fair enough. Bay kidnappers swapped you and your parents' child. A coven of hags lost one of their members you were created to replace that hag. Cool, fun origin stuff, I dig it. Nothing ridiculously like unique or unheard of here, but um, a, good, a good place to start. A good source of inspiration for creating your character. Uh, Hexblood traits. Let's look at these. Medium or small, once again, you can be fey, you are fey and humanoid. 30 feet, you get dark vision. Fey resilience. You have advantage on saving throws you make to avoid or end the charmed condition on yourself. Hex magic. You can cast the disguise self and hex spells with this trait. Intelligence, wisdom, or charisma is your spellcasting ability for these spells. And you have to choose it when you gain the lineage. Once you cast either of these spells with this trait, you can't do it again until you finish a long rest. You can also cast these spells using any spell slots you have. Okay, so basically you add those spells to your spellbook, and you can cast them once per day for free, or if you're a spellcaster, you can expend them with you can expend spell slots to use them. Now let's look at this magic token thing. As an action, you can harmlessly pull out one of your nails, a tooth, or a lock of hair. This token is imbued with magic until you finish a long rest. While the token is imbued in this way, you can use an action to send a telepathic message to the creature holding or carrying the token as long as you are within the same plane of existence and are within 10 miles of it. The message can contain up to 25 words. Okay, so that's 
basically ascending with the much more limited range. In addition, while you are within 10 miles of the token, you can use an action to enter a trance for one minute during which you can see and hear from the token as if you are located where it is. While you are using your senses at the token's location, you are blinded and deafened, blah blah blah, kind of like looking through your familiar, and then afterward the token is harmlessly destroyed. Once you create a token using this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest, at which point your missing part regrows. Okay, so once a long rest, you can create this token. Uh, if you give it to another creature, you can send them a message, um, as long as they're within 10 miles of you, or you can use it to kind of, I don't know, look at spots. That's pretty cool. Um, more of a more of a utility based one that does feel more fey inspired which makes sense it's a bit more trickery um centric again i'm enjoying these new mechanics i am really really enjoying these like interactions that these lineages are giving you i loved the bite and i love the magic token i will say once again these are feeling ever so slightly more overloaded than the other races are just because they have these features that you can interact with on a regular basis that a lot of the other races just simply don't have. These are a bit more game-changing in their power, whereas the other racial features that you get oftentimes are little small boosts that you can get here or there, which I'm a fan of. I like that these are more interactive and that these feel more impactful because it makes me actively want to play this kind of character, whereas usually races, like I said before, don't really impact my decision. And finally, we've got the Reborn. I'm guessing this is kind of a, maybe a Revenant sort of thing. Death isn't always the end. The Reborn exemplify this, being individuals who have died yet somehow still live. Some Reborn exhibit the scars of fatal fates, their ashen flesh missing, missing limbs or bloodless veins, making it clear that they've been touched by death. Other Reborn are marvels of magic or science being stitched together from disparate beings or bearing mysterious minds and manufactured bodies. Whatever their origins, Reborn know a new life and seek experiences and answers all their own. Okay, so these aren't necessarily any specific kind of creature that's been Reborn. It's basically anything that has died and has then come back. Whatever creative ways those might be, I'm guessing we'll see some origins down below. Faded memories. Reborn suffer from some manner of discontinuity, an interruption of their lives or physical state that their minds are ill-equipped to deal with. Their memories of events before this interruption are often vague or absent. Occasionally, the most unexpected experiences might cause sensations or visions of the past to come rushing back. Rather than sleeping, Reborn regularly sit and dwell on the past, hoping for some revelation of what came before. Most of the time, these are dark, silent stretches. Occasionally, though, in a moment of peace, stress, or excitement, a Reborn gains a glimpse of what came before. When you desire to have such dreamlike vision, roll on the Lost Memories table to inspire its details. Oh, cool. So this actually is really fun. This offers a lot of opportunity for the DM to play with roleplay, um, because there's kind of this, there's a trope that you see all the time of a character who's lost their memories, and this one goes even deeper into that, where it allows you to start to roll on this table to figure out what memories they slowly start to recover, which, as a DM, can be hard to kind of space out and and give the love that it deserves so i'm glad they're introducing some examples that the dm can use and also that players can pull from to help inspire their uh, their backstory that they may or may not have written themselves you recall a physically painful moment a memory causes you sh to shed a tear you recall a childhood memory a memory brings with it the voice of someone once close to you you recall enjoying something that you can't stand doing now okay yeah so these basically ask questions just to help inform the DM of what memory this character is having. I like that a lot because this is one of my favorite things to do. Um, one of my players in the campaign I just finished running a couple months ago, um, he was playing a character who had lost all of his memories uh, from like a pretty much a previous life. He was actually very similar to this and uh, I slowly started introducing bits and pieces of his backstory. Sometimes it went over really well, other times it wasn't as impactful as I would have liked. And these are all really nice guidelines to kind of get the DM thinking about what those memories actually contain. And um, it's helpful having something like this to help you get more specific with what you want to do. And this can lead you in a good direction. Uh, and here's some of the origins. You were magically resurrected, but something went wrong. Stitches bind your body's mismatched pieces, and your memories come from multiple different lives. Ooh, I like that one. 
Stitches bind your body's mismatched pieces and your memories come from multiple different lives, implying that you are not one person, you are several people stitched together. That is fun. After clawing free from your grave, you realized you have no memories except for a single name. You were a necromancer's undead servant for years. One day, your consciousness returned. That's fun. You awoke in an abandoned laboratory alongside complex designs for clockwork organs. You were released after being petrified for generations. Your memories have faded, though, and your body is not what it once was. Your body hosts a possessing spirit that shares its memories and replaces your appendages with phantasmal limbs. In public, you pass as an unremarkable individual, but you can feel the itchy straw stuffing inside of you. <laughs> Hold on. So number eight. You're you're a scarecrow. <laughs> you're just a scarecrow. Which I know is an actual type of creature in D&D, but that is really, really funny. So, so this means that the lion, the scarecrow, and the tin man are all reborn. So, uh... If anyone runs an adventure with just a reborn party, you've already got a plot written out for you. Reborn traits. Humanoid as well as construct or undead, so you can choose one or the other. Medium or small, again, you get to choose. Speed, 30 feet, dark vision, deathless nature. You have escaped death, a fact represented by the following benefits. Oh, here we go. You have advantage on saving throws against disease and being poisoned, and you have resistance to poison damage. Wow. Oh, that's already really strong right off the bat. You have advantage on death saving throws. You don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. You don't need to sleep, and magic can't put you to sleep. You can finish a long rest in four hours if you meditate, basically. Wow. Okay, so that's actually a lot. That's a lot of benefits right there. It makes sense because you are either a construct or undead, and constructs or undead have all those features pretty much throughout 5e, but in a player character format, having advantage on death saving throws, as well as being resistant to poison damage and having advantage on saving throws against disease and poison, all of that combined into one player character just from a race uh, feature is really crazy. And this could be it. Uh, this could be the only feature that you have. Everything else could go away and you'd still be one of the stronger races for sure. That's crazy. Uh, I think some of those might get removed. Uh, they Again, they make sense thematically and mechanically. They make sense, but I think it's just a lot. But we'll see. And lastly, knowledge from a past life. You temporarily remember sporadic glimpses from the past, perhaps faded memories from ages ago or previous life. When you make an ability check that uses a skill, you can roll a d6 and add the number rolled to the check. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Wow, okay. So not only do you get all this stuff, you can also, proficiency bonus times a day at least, add a d6 to any skill check. That's pretty strong. Um, not crazy, honestly, because it's a D6 and it's only a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus between long rests. So not game breaking by any means. And especially because it's just a skill check, it's not going to be too wild. Um, I like this one. It's kind of hinting at having these skills in the previous life that you don't remember. However, I think I'd like to see them make it a little bit more specific. Um, maybe when you gain this lineage, you can pick a few skills that you had in a past life. Maybe it's the ones you're proficient with, and um, those are the ones that you've got from your past life. I don't know, but making it kind of just any skill check feels almost counter per counterintuitive to what this to what this race wants to do. Um, but combined with all this stuff, I mean, this is a very potent racial feature <laughs> uh no doubt i think this one is probably the strongest of the three um from a mechanical advantage standpoint you have having advantage on death saves is just so ridiculous because you already have death saves to begin with that is one of the biggest complaints about 5e from people who have played uh previous editions is that death saves and just the what it takes to die as a player character in 5e is already a lot. And so adding in a race that makes it even more difficult, I get that there aren't other races that do that, so this is like the specific one that does that, but that's really, really strong either way. So I'd maybe like to see a couple of these things disappear, maybe just this bit. I think if they just had um, the first the first feature 
and then the second and th or the third and fourth feature, then that would be a lot more balanced. And then um, having knowledge from a past life would be totally fine while also making it maybe a little bit more specific to fit the thematic of the race of the lineage a little bit better. But um, otherwise, I really like it. And I like all three of these. Uh, I I've said it multiple times already, but I actually want to play these races, which is the first time I've really felt that. Um, I haven't been particularly attached to one race or the other. When I create a character, I think of where they came from, and then I usually base the race off of that, where these people might be, uh, whatever race it is. If I want to be in a character from the woods or something, that I could be a wood elf, or if I want to be um, a half-orc or something like that, you know, there's that's kind of what determines my race more than actual just desire to play that race. So reading these... Um, excites me for the future of 5e because I think they're taking race in a direction that makes it more enticing and can actually be a more vital part of character creation rather than just being like, here's a couple attributes, here's the, the ability score bonuses that they get, and that's what every single one of these classes is going to be, or at least the large majority of them. So I really like where this is going. Again, none of this is official yet, and obviously they're uh, just announcing uh, their, their next book, and I doubt these will be in it. So um, you probably won't see these being printed in anything anytime soon, but otherwise I like the direction they're taking. Um, if you don't like that they're kind of opening up the attribute bonuses and whatnot, then you don't have to use it. That's, I think, the most important thing to remember is that if you don't agree with this kind of ruling, then you, as the DM, as long as your players are okay with it, can do whatever you want. This is just the direction that they are taking 5e currently, and I personally am a fan because it opens up the options even more, which I think is what 5e is all about, is being able to do whatever the hell you want, however you want to do it. So yeah, those are the new gothic lineages that have been added. I personally am really excited to see where these go. Let me know in the comments if you guys have any thoughts on these. Uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Please remember to hit the subscribe button right below me. Thank you all very, very much for watching, and I'll see you around.